I got Charlie Fritz here. I'm excited to have you, Charles. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be in Tucson well, with you. Yeah, you know, you're a wonderful artist, and I've always loved your work, collected your work. I don't represent you, but, uh, you know, I would if I could. I can't, so I just get to enjoy <laughs> you as a person and the pieces that are on my wall. You've uh, been a supporter and a friend for a long time, yeah. and we've kept this really cool relationship, even though we can't work together all the time. It's just been a fun friendship. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things about the art world, you know, that you do get to develop. If you're if you're smart and do it, you can develop relationships with artists, and collectors can do this too. You know, they get to meet artists at different shows, and you do a couple of different shows. You do, what, the one in uh, Pre to West still, right? Still do Pre to West, uh, at one point, I was in 16 shows during a year. Okay. It was going like crazy at one time, uh -huh. but I backed off quite a bit. I work with the C.M. Russell Museum right? and the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, uh, some with the Buffalo Bill. Yes. Yeah. So. Because you're a Montana boy. Yep. Still up in the northern tier. <laughs> yeah. And you were raised there? I was raised in northern Iowa. I see. Which yeah. was the frontier at one time. Yeah, it was. Well, the Sioux, actually, uh, their home country was north of Lake Superior. Oh, well. And they got dominoed, you know, down out of that country. Uh -huh. And they came down through Minnesota and then swung out to the west and ended up in the Black Hills. So so yeah. you grew up in Iowa. That's where mm -hmm. you grew up? Yep. And you, and you were, how many kids were in your family? Just myself and my sister. Uh -huh. My dad was an art teacher and that we were just uh -huh. always doing creative things. And, and where did he teach? Uh, he taught uh, everything from elementary up through a junior college that was in town there and eventually became a elementary school principal. But we just were always doing creative stuff. And uh, he was in charge of the North of uh, the Cerro Gordo County uh, Fair art exhibit. And so I have a whole fistful of ribbons from from that uh, era. Yeah, and when was your first ribbon? Do you remember? I don't remember that, but I sold my first painting in seventh grade. In seventh grade. And so when you did that, when you sold that painting, <clears throat> did that click something in your mind, like I could be an artist, do you think? You know, Iowa is a, uh, <laughs> a Midwest state, so mm -hmm. you're a teacher or a minister or a banker or a farmer. Um, the option to become an artist was not ever really... Uh, something you gave any thought to you were going to do something else and and doing this creative stuff was something you did on the side even with your father being an art teacher yeah i remember you know i graduated from high school in 73 and when you looked around at what was available for art schools at the time there wasn't too much one of the main ones was hallmark greeting cards had a art school that's right in kansas city i think it was but that wasn't you know what i wanted to do and then i went to iowa state and that was you know uh dipped the dog's tail in a bucket of paint and make it excited and see what you got for mm -hmm. a product <laughs> that wasn't my idea either so I started teaching uh, and I only taught for a year and a half and then I left and pursued art uh, full-time after that so let me back up a little bit when you won that ribbon because I want to get back to that did you feel something different about where you were your created your creative abilities because I see, I find this in a lot of artists that they win, you know, not only did you win ribbons, you actually got money, yeah. um, that it changes them somehow. Do you think that might have been a pivotal point? Definitely got uh, a lot of positive reinforcement in that way. Uh, was winning these ribbons. I should point out my dad wasn't the judge. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember in first grade, our our teacher uh, took a trip to Hawaii and was gone for a couple of weeks. And our substitute had us, um, you know, uh, make cards to send to her. And I had the whole classroom around my desk watching me do my card. And that's, I did get a lot of attention coming up through the years of school and things. For, and did uh, your dad and your mom give you uh, accolades too and said, oh, you're good? Yeah. yeah they did. Yeah, did he yeah. help you with any of it? And when I was in junior high, we just went on a binge for about three years. We had a ping pong table downstairs and we uh, got it all set up for oil painting. And, you know, I was buying these canvas boards and oil paints and we were just painting up a storm. Anything that came to mind, my dad was painting next to me and things and my sister. And uh, I still have a stack 12 inches high of uh, those early oh, paintings. That's really interesting. <laughs> and what did your sister do? What did she end up doing? She went into uh, education as well, and she's been teach, uh, selling textbooks for many years now, too. They still make those? 
Well, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. I was just talking with her the other day, and uh, you know, now it's almost all a digital yes, type program that they sell to these professors and things. So she's, uh, you know, morphed into followed the evolution of all that sort of thing. And was she your younger or older sister? Four years younger. Okay, so she's the baby of the family. Yeah. yeah. So you go to school, and you actually go to an art school to begin with. No, I never did. You didn't. Okay. No. You went to, was it a teaching, call, to, to get a teaching degree? Right. Uh, I was really big into racing snowmobiles at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there was a junior college close by that allowed me to stay and work at the jo local John Deere store and keep up my racing <laughs> schedule, which uh, it sounds silly now, but uh, fortunately that junior college and that John Deere dealership was there because it kept me in school while I was extinguishing this other interest <laughs> and that was racing snowmobiles yeah did you get paid to do that kind no, of no i never got paid. it was just something you loved to do i worked with a local dealer and there was about six of us that raced out of his dealership and, and what did you do at john deere what were you doing there uh mostly snowmobile related things yeah okay yeah <laughs> but then when uh went on to iowa state and played hockey down there and had a good time uh did you play for you iowa played state. for iowa state you know at that time it was a club sport yeah but it was Big time passion, and so you graduate with a degree in ed education. education, and yep. so and a history minor. Oh, that's where the history comes yep, in. Yep. And were you always interested in history, or was it college that really brought that alive? You know, I I found a uh, pendant, uh, an Indian pendant along the Winnebago River there in North Iowa one time, uh, and it was made from a clam shell, so it was real iridescent, and it had a hole real precisely placed in it and things and that pendant is what really sparked a lot of interest and i How i was always making at that time uh maybe fourth grade or so oh yeah so you're and a little kid yeah in my boy scout troop i i got them all excited about indians and we had a powwow and made costumes and things and so just i have pictures of myself in indian costumes with you know, the kitchen towels and, and uh, eagle feathers cut out of cardboard and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And it was like that most... one pendant that you found that really... Yeah, yeah. And do you I st still have it. Yeah, you still have that yeah, pendant. Yeah. And how old was that? Do we know? No. Yeah. But it was something that was worn. Yeah. something that was clearly special for somebody a yep. long time ago. Yep. yep and, you, right. and you could relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, we... My, I had a great circle of friends and they were... We were all kindred spirits as far as being out in the woods all the time and chasing around and trying to snare rabbits and look for arrowheads and things too. Yeah, and climbing trees and build forts and yeah. fish and all that. Yeah, I was fortunate to grow up on a in an area that had these small uh, reclaimed clay pits that made these beautiful lakes, and the fishing was unbelievable. So you know wow. we could. Yeah, that does sound fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And it, so that pendant somehow clicked something in your head about history. Yeah. About, and was it mainly the history of Iowa and, and Native American and early Western history at that point? Or was it more deeply? Because you ended up getting a degree, a partial degree in history too, right? Yes. You know, I would say that, that my earliest interest in history would have been Minnesota and the North Woods and Canada. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, Schoenover book, The Edge of Wilderness. Mm -mm. Uh, that's a great book when he takes a trip. He leaves... Uh, uh, Harvey Dunn or Dean Cornwell, his uh, teacher at the time, and and goes on a, a many month trip up north and things, and and consequently he comes back and does a lot of the best illustrations that we have of of that Northwoods Arctic uh, subject matter that the stories were being written about in the magazines at and the time. What year would that have been? Do you know when he did those illustrations? Because Dunn's early. I'm guessing in the teens maybe yeah, early on yeah yeah so uh my dad's family was from minnesota my okay. grandpa was a lutheran minister and traveled all over the north country in the iron range and i always kind of wished we'd move back up there when i was in iowa because so. there was better hunting and fishing is that why? yeah and it's just the aura of the whole thing yeah. you know i love that that country and and every snowshoes and mm -hmm. and bark houses and all that sort of thing so so when you're teaching at the school and you're doing this in the, is it like a junior college or a high school? No, I was teaching, teaching in elementary. Okay. Were you still drawing and painting and doing things along that way or had you put it aside? No, I, I, I uh, 
was doing these pen and ink and then coloring them with watercolors all through college. Even in college, I was doing that sort of thing. And uh, when I was teaching school, I painted a lot with watercolors and things. And it got to the point, you know, where uh, you have this whole stack and you've given them away to all your friends and Mm -hmm. they're all full up. And it's so what do I do with these? And someone said, well, you should do an art in the park. Well, that's a good idea. What's an art in the park? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, you know, I bought a tent and and, uh, started going and shopping all the hobby shops and whatnot to find framing and, and framed all these things. And pretty soon I was making more money on the weekends than I was teaching school during the week. And where the art in the park, was this in, where in Iowa was this? Well, uh, I was teaching in a small town called Boone, which is right outside of Ames, where Iowa State is, only about 40 miles north of Des Moines. So the beauty of that country back there, uh, as it relates to this sort of thing, is there's just so much more population. And you didn't have to travel very far, you know, to to get into another art in the park. You could go to Waterloo, you could go to Cedar Rapids, you could go and to And they'd Moyne. set up a tent and there'd be a bunch of artists that would come and... Yeah, and they set. were organized functions, you know. And you uh, pay them something to, to get a tent. For I don't yourself. even remember if I did. Oh. <laughs> I'm not too sure. There, I can't remember yeah. how, how that worked. But it didn't take long for you to realize, hey, wait, I'm actually making a better living doing this and teaching history in elementary school. Huh? It was an odd thing. I kind of thought I would pursue, you know... Uh, becoming mm-hmm. an elementary principal and mm-hmm. maybe even a superintendent sometime. But I had, already, and I didn't dislike teaching, but I'd only been there about four months and I was already thinking, well, what am I going to do next? Yeah. And I do you think any of that was out. driven by your dad being a teacher and you wanted to make him happy, that kind of thing? And he's like, yeah, this is a good profession. I don't think it was that so much. Uh, I just didn't see very many options at the time. It was just a fairly small world. Uh, I just didn't. And you're single at this point. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just didn't see any options other than what was right in front of me. You know what my, what my friends' parents did, and what my parents did. Yeah. That's that's what you know at that time. You didn't see a, a way out. I guess in a way, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't have an answer exactly for that. It's yeah. Just, <laughs> at, uh, it, I mean, it's it home. My understanding, yeah. but. I don't want to call it provincial, but it's a little bit like that. Yeah, I grew up in a small town. I understand. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but uh, I I actually sold a uh, paint a watercolor of a red-tailed hawk for ninety dollars, <laughs> and I sold a painting of two yellow shafted flickers for one hundred and twenty-five. And I thought that prepared me for quitting teaching, and I did. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I've always said, yeah. if a guy had any brains at all, you wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And did and did you, how'd you sign those? Did you sign those as C. Fritz, or how did you? I think you Charles Fritz back. You put Charles yeah. Fritz. Okay, in case yeah. they run, a, I run across them. I'll know what they originally paid There's for. There's a, a couple of those that have made it into museums now oh back my. in Iowa. Oh, is that right? Yeah, oh, people that's have funny. donated them. So you leave teaching and you go, okay, I'm going to do this as a, as a profession or try to make a living at it. And so where do you go? What do you do? Uh, I moved back to Mason City. Uh, at that time, um, the Ducks Unlimited phenomenon was huge. I remember that. And all the prints and all the different ducks coming into pond number 13. And uh, Maynard, uh, not Maynard Reese. Dixon, Maynard Reese mm-hmm. was the hot ticket at I the time. That. And he lived in Des Moines. And every spring in the Des Moines Register, we had a picture magazine back in those days. And every spring there would be an insert called the Songbirds of Iowa. And mm. it was a really well done mm-hmm. uh, thing of cardinals and meadowlarks and every, all the Songbirds of Iowa that would be in that picture magazine. And I looked forward to that every year and, and had multiple copies of it saved up, you know. And I. Uh, and did I you used think to know, I want to be in that? Um, it just, all that natural history and animals, I loved pheasant and duck hunt mm-hmm. and all that and anything in nature was interesting and like to bird watch, still feed the birds. I had, when I came, it was four degrees when I left 
Billings this morning. <laughs> and <laughs> that four was, degrees here, is That it? was up from minus 14 the night before, which was up from minus 23 the night before. <laughs> so I had to actually leave people in charge of my bird feeders to make sure they got refilled <laughs> while I was gone. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to Tucson to do this show It was now? pretty amazing when you walk off the... Uh, uh, airplane you know and you've got kind of that outside walkway between yeah. the airport and the rental car thing and that's your first taste of feels oh like hawaii goodness. almost right yeah oh, it's yeah. 80 today yeah it's 87 tomorrow i think or something well it's really hot it's so hard to pack for down here when you come from up there i over <laughs> i bring too warm of stuff every time <laughs> huh? that's funny and so you give it a go you say i'm going to start painting and you what how do you go about that what do you do to make a living yeah so i i Quickly, one of the interesting things that I've talked to young people who are contemplating a switch of any sort, you know, when you're giving your days to teaching and you're just kind of working around the fringes of, of this art possibility, um, when I left teaching and could give art my all, all kinds of things opened up that I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And it was a really good time to do that because the print market was just, Taking off. So hot. And, and what kind of things could it open up that you could, well, back, couldn't do the, when you were working? Uh, you know, in the at that time, prints were hot. And so all these little towns in Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin, they all had an art gallery. <laughs> and they were selling... Prints. Prints of duck stamps and ducks and and anything wildlife not anything wildlife it, it was midwest wildlife white-tailed deer ducks and pheasants and this is kind of late 70s um you graduate high school yeah, 73 correct. right yeah yep, okay late 70s and so i could come out i could do a painting and print it well it, there's a magazine called the iowa conservationist and uh so it was a thin little quarterly deal and I sent a picture of this yellow shafted flicker painting to them and they used it on the back cover. Mm. Well, I started getting these letters in the mail. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do you have prints of it? Well, what's a print? <laughs> <laughs> and so, oh so I look into how do I print this right. thing? And uh, I had the company in Des Moines, Iowa who printed Better Homes and Garden at the time uh, run me off 500 of them or something. And, you know, the going price was 75 to to $100 back then. And I figured, well, I'm just starting in things and I got to make this Work. entry level. So $25 was retail price. For your prints. And did you sign them and date them or yeah, uh, number numbered them? them? Yep. And how many would you do in a print? Well, I think there was 500 of those. But so the wholesale price to the galleries was $12.50. Oh, God, they loved you, didn't they? Because they probably <laughs> exactly. put it at 75 I, uh I had a Volkswagen Sunbug at the time, and I was driving all over the Midwest. I'd come, I'd do a painting, and uh, print it, and then take off on the road and walk into these galleries. Pretty soon, you get an established relationship, mm -hmm. but you know, you could hit six galleries in a day, and each one of them would take three to five prints. I mean, I was rolling. Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> and what would you do with the paintings themselves? I would sell them. Yeah. yeah. And what would you get for an original watercolor, Charles Fritz watercolor? Yeah, uh, I think some of those full sheet watercolors after a couple of years were like fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, that's not bad. No, it was good. Yeah, I mean that beats seventy five bucks. Yeah, yeah, I, so. I traded in my sunbun for a Mazda RX seven uh -huh. fairly quickly. Uh -huh. That was darting around in that thing. And so at that point, you're really a wildlife artist. Yeah, you're doing mainly mainly birds, but any th or were you doing deer and the whole shebang? In an effort to set myself apart in those days, um, there were some great duck painters of course and some of them were like david moss you know i mean he comes out of illustration he knows his way around mm -hmm. he's painting some beautiful things that i can't compete with mm -hmm. at this point and uh so i had this idea for uh, a still life of the old wooden decoys what were called blocks yes uh, and uh i did this painting which turned out really well ducks unlimited used it on their cover of their annual report it, that painting and prints that I donated to DU raised thirty thousand dollars at wow. that time, which and that was, was huge. A, was that an oil? It or was a watercolor. It was a watercolor. Yeah, and I, I had evolved into my own style of watercolor, uh, which was glazing, and 
so if I wanted to paint the face of a of a, uh, the breast of a Drake Mallard decoy, that's a deep umbery brown. Mm -hmm. I would start with yellow, yellow ochre, raw sienna, uh, uh, you know, and work my way up. Mm -hmm. And and so I'd get this pretty rich, deep layering effect. And I do that over this whole sheet of arches. With watercolor. With watercolor. Yeah. So they were richer and people kind of... Um, almost like a gouache feeling to them? Probably. Yeah. And a little bit of gouache for the yeah. for the whites. And so, uh, yeah, they were... I was going to the Ducks Unlimited art shows in Kansas City and Des Moines and Omaha. And would they have artists come in and have their original oils and also set on watercolors and sell prints as well? Yeah, some would allow prints, some wouldn't. And you could probably make a fairly good living just doing that, right? Yeah, at the time it was great for a single guy. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. And so how long did you do, were you the duck man? So I guess that's what I was started out to say was I uh, kind of morphed out of the actual birds and into these sporting still lives, I called them. And they were of like, so these are first duck decoys, which are really cool. I like yeah. that idea. You should yeah. do it again. Yeah. And <laughs> I bet they'd be great. And then what? What else did uh, you do? You know, I did fly fishing with creels and old it. fly rods, old bait casting. So things everything with old associated plugs, with the outdoor life outdoors. and and shotguns and things yeah, like that too. Yeah. Mallards hanging with shotguns, pheasants hanging. Yeah. So you really a, kind of found a niche that you liked, and of course you knew about it because you loved to hunt and fish anyway. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And you did that for how long? Just. Two or three or four years. Okay. And then I moved out to Montana in 1980. I, when I moved to Montana, I was still doing those, and I was still actually driving back to the Midwest to attend shows and things. What took you to Montana? That's a big jump. You're a kid that's been in Iowa and has never really left Iowa. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Joan, uh, was an orchestra teacher. So you got married somewhere after yeah, this yeah, when you were... Right a, so when you married... Joan, mm -hmm. she was, uh, you were an artist at that point in time? You were making your living as yes. an artist? Okay. Yep, yep. So she, you you picked up some yeah. extra uh, goodies on your way to becoming an artist. And, and so she, you guys have been married for how long? Uh, we were married for 36 years. Yeah, but and how long were you before you went to Montana? A few um, years? No, just one. Oh, one year. And yeah, so she yeah. got a job. Yeah, she was an orchestra teacher in the oh. Billings School District. Oh, very good. And yeah. so there we go. Yeah. So, uh, but then when I got to Montana and got exposed to the landscape and the Western history and things, that just grabbed hold of me. And I quite quickly wanted to leave that Midwestern subject matter. And there was a man named Hall Deitman, uh, who was a well-known artist there in Billings. And there was another artist who had Previous, had passed away before I got there, Leroy Green. Mm -hmm. You would love Leroy Green's work. It was really nice stuff. And Hall Deitman was a really good painter, just much more detailed and much tighter. Mm -hmm. But uh, Hall Deitman uh, took me under his wing and taught me a lot about luminosity and uh, the color wheel. And I, I use what he taught me every day. So that was basically your apprenticeship for school, really. Was, yeah, yeah. Was this I studied with him for about eight or nine months and just learned a lot. And then I continued to stick with him. He was right there in town. But I went over there every day. Uh, this is in for Billings? Nine months. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, I've often, <laughs> it's too bad that both Leroy Green and Hall Deitman uh, aren't known farther and wider. They both were, they just sold everything they did pretty much locally. But made a living. Made a living. And uh, and they were talented enough to be in the running with all the guys that mm -hmm. we know. I don't know if Billings was just isolated. Uh, I don't know the exact reason why they didn't get out and around more. But Well, I think that's sometimes what it is. If you don't get good gallery representation. Now, nowadays, it's a little different because you have the internet and Facebook and oh, Instagram yeah. and all that stuff. So you can get exposure worldwide. But especially back then, yep. you know, if you didn't have... There was no interstate yeah. going to Billings. I mean, oh, wow. you know, when it took you got, a blacktop well, yeah. road from Rapid City, which was a blacktop mm -hmm. road from mm -hmm. Sioux Falls, which was a blacktop road from Minneapolis. Did you worry about that when you were there, that it's going to be tough to make a living as an artist being in Billings? No, I actually found Montana. You know, but at that time, the C.M. Russell auction was, it was and still is a real big deal in the state. I found that the, the local, uh, not the local, but the, 
the average person in in Montana was so much more art aware and art interested. Mm. You think that's because of Russell? I think Montana's just had a long history of uh, artists artist. and yeah. and literary people yeah. amongst them. Dixon went there. Norman McLean. I mean, the, the arts have been ingrained ingrained into that into that population. I'm sure, like New Mexico and yeah, yeah. And and you got to Billings in kind of early eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nineteen eighty, and you've never left, right? No, yeah, it's yeah, it's just been a great place as far as carrying on business. It's uh, I don't really sell that much into Montana anymore, but um, good airport, the intersection of two interstates, uh, it's just easy to, and and the material to paint is is so diverse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, within a hundred mile circle of me, I can yeah. just paint a lot of different things. But you choose to do a lot of different things. Like for our show, you have a, you know, Santa Fe Trail piece. Where was that picture, that image done? By the way, where is that? Specific? Down by the San Jacinto Mountains by Palm Desert. Okay, that's In, what I wondered. Indio, if, I wondered if that Indio was it. Area. Yeah, both the old Spanish trail, which went north out of Santa Fe and actually clipped. Went up through the San Juans of Colorado, mm-hmm. got into Utah, and then dropped back down. Uh, and then the Gila Trail, which people are familiar with around here, uh, that went right along the southern boundary border. Um, both of those trails come back together right there at that gap mm. at Indio and Palm Desert there, and, and they drop down through the mountains into the mm. Valley. Is, is that the Central Valley? Yeah. Would that be right to call it that? Yeah, I think so. And I, I actually had a couple of your Palm Spring pieces that you painted. Yeah. A little study and then a big major piece that you did that came on the resale and I ended up somehow with them. Yep. Uh, a judge from uh, Illinois mm-hmm. had a home down there yep. and uh, had commissioned me to go down there and I did that big painting for him and when it came time for them to downsize, I referred him to. I remember that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I should recognize that mountain range because I, <laughs> yeah. I wondered about that. But you, so you've done a lot of different subject matter. But this seems like one of the things that has been uh, dear to your heart, and maybe we're jumping a little bit, but is the the uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, the whole exposition of the that. And yeah. so tell yeah, tell a... us a little bit about that because that's a life changer for you. Yeah, it was a huge thing, and it continues to be. Uh, just to backtrack one moment to the yeah. eclecticness of everything. Um, that's one thing I've always been very uh, blessed with, that my clientele and the people who are interested in my paintings allow me a lot of latitude. I look at a lot of artists who, and partly it's partly the artist's fault, I believe, for pigeonholing themselves. They, they land on something that they realize people like, and they ride that pony and do you think getting changing from doing duck decoys to landscape and and other oil type complete different genre has given you that ability to go I can do other things and not have to worry that there's going to be an audience? Yeah, I think it just sort of evolved, probably as you say, um, as you might be. I I just have a lot of interests. I'm like you. I mean, a lot of things interest me. Yeah. Uh, I'm sort of a, maybe a master of none, but interested in everything. <laughs> Another one of that. But, uh, so I, I've painted and enjoy, uh, wall tents on the Homer spit in Alaska or in a moose hunting camp. I remember that one. Painting yeah. You yeah had. I remember that's right. Do you, you still like have that little painting? Oh uh, yeah. I still yeah. remember that painting. Yeah. Little... I remember you wanted to buy it. Oh my that God. One. That was a fantastic <laughs> painting. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and Glacier Park and, uh, the Indian Wars, and then you come down into here, and you got the Gila Trail, and and the Santa Fe Trail, and the Adobes, and all that. But the common thread, some someone might look at that body of work and say, "Well, it's just way diverse." But to me, there's a real common thread that goes through it all, and that's the thread that intrigues me the most. And that's to be observant and to appreciate how human beings have found a way to live in the environment that they landed in. I mean, you have Eskimos that found a way to live in that environment. You have Canyon del Marto that they found mm-hmm. a way to live in there, Canyon de Shea. Um, uh, I just find all these different indigenous people's ways of, of learning how to cope 
interesting. Yeah, and just the inhabitants too, not just indigenous, because you do a yeah. lot of yeah. Western early and just home today. study type yeah. people. Yep. So, will you art? Does your artwork always have that subject matter kind of somewhere in it? I think you would probably find it. Yeah, I mean, this is really interesting to me because I really hadn't thought about it, but I'm running through, you know, most of the paintings I've seen or handled over the past, and I do, it's there. Yeah. Even if it's just a, you know, something that was there and is gone, a burial, an old burial right. mound. I can remember, I actually have one in my house that is exactly of that. Is uh, it that eight by six? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that painting. Yeah, it's in my house as I walk, I see it every day as I walk into my house. Nice, thank and, you. And oh no, it's fantastic! I mean, you're a great painter, and uh, I want to be a, around it. <laughs> but when you do your work, it's not just uh, historical, too. I mean, you do things that are today. Yeah, yep. I, uh, you know, there was a time when I, I love Martin Henning's paintings, mm. and I got very intrigued by them at one point, and I started experimenting with, you know finding that sinuous line in nature and the cottonwoods his famous cottonwoods i i see that those lines in the cottonwoods mm -hmm. up by me all the time especially now in the winter they're just beautiful when they're bare um and there was a time there where i uh started down that path and started to put all these design elements into my paintings and things and then i would travel somewhere and I would want to do the vermilion cliffs. Mm -hmm. Well, the vermilion cliffs don't lend themselves, don't lend that. themselves right. to that kind of line, but I wanted to paint the vermilion cliffs. And I realized that if you're going to look at the world through one of these filters, then you got to live with that filter mm -hmm. under all circumstances. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even Martin Hennings was not successful oh, yeah. at times when he tried to apply it to something that didn't work on. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so I backed away from that, uh, and I, I still, I like to find the abstract shapes in nature and capitalize on them when they're uh, present, but at the same token, uh, a hardwoods forest in North Iowa, when I'm back there visiting, mm -hmm. um, is beautiful. So why not paint it? And then you've got to deal with a whole bunch of lost edges. And do you like to edit? So there, you edit some of the details to get um, to more simplistic at times? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, that's the thing about painting on location, which I just always do. I mean, I still use other references and things, but I never stop going out and painting from life. And the beauty of painting from life is when you've got that, 10 by 12 inch uh, panel in front of you and you have about three hours uh, for, as far as the sun's movement mm -hmm. before things change mm -hmm. so um, it forces you to move quickly and it forces you to edit and it forces you to simplify <clears throat> and some of that you do consciously consciously you say I can do without that and a whole lot of it is subconscious and it's just kind of ingrained in the process and you get better at the process. And so what I like, what I feel I get when I come out of the other end of that three hours is this distillation of what was in front of me. And, and it's like a good whiskey or something. It's, it's pure. Mm. Um, what's that, left yeah. there is what you really need. And, and it's the essence of the spot. And a big part of, of a good painting, I think, is when the artist doesn't forget why he started it. Mm. <laughs> or she started it. Uh, you know, you have to remember what, what made you stop and want to do that spot. From that angle, from that time frame, from all of it. And what is that that usually draws you into a spot? What are you looking for? I know that's a hard question, but... Yeah, I think it's probably so many different things depending on the... In the Midwest, I was just back there visiting my parents and, you know, it can be a fantastic trunk of an oak tree with, with snow on it that stands out apart from all the other younger underbrush that is just all lost edges. 
abstract, really yeah. basically abstract it, imagery. In the end it is, yeah. yeah. Uh, you go into Utah or somewhere with the cliffs and things, and it can be the, the sharp edge between sunlight and shadow. Mm. I.e. Dixon did a lot of those. Sure, yeah. And could be the rising moon. Mm-hmm. Do you keep a lot of those little studies for, for, for references to use in other paintings? Yeah, I do like to keep them. I do sell them too. It just depends. Yeah, I do think so, some of those are just some of the most fantastic pieces. Yeah. Those little ones, I, I just do. Yeah, yeah. I I would be happy if I uh, just painted small paintings all the time mm-hmm. and just traveled and painted them. Yeah. When you look at one of those paintings, are you back in that spot, that moment in time? The, 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 the whole setting comes back to you, the smells, the temperature, all that? It's amazing how many times I've, uh, I mean, I have studies around my studio that have been there for 25 years, and I'm still waiting for the day when I make something out of them. Yeah, like the one I wanted to buy 15 <laughs> years, 18 years, 20 years ago, maybe. But I'll, uh, but an interesting thing that's happened numerous times is this field study will be, banging around my studio for 10 years or something. And uh, I'll think one day the day will come and it's, I'm going to do that painting now. And and I go back, and in the old days, you go back through your boxes of slides. Mm-hmm. And uh, you'd think, well, I know I took a bunch of slides that day. I'll find that box. And mm-hmm. So you, you get the slides out and you hold them up to the light. And it's like, well, that's there's nothing inspiring about that. Look at the next slide. There's nothing inspiring about that. And you finally realize the reality of the spot has become that painting. I see. And you don't use the slides at all. The, the, the study becomes the genesis of the big painting. Yeah. And that's what you're trying to distillate anyway, is to get to that little sense of three hours into a big format. Yeah. Well, and the thing that I also believe is uh, when you stand in front of a Rungius painting or an Ufer painting, mm-hmm. um, any of our great painters. Uh, and those paintings now are 80 to 120 years old. Um, why do we stand in front of them and why do they intrigue us? Mm-hmm. Well, to me, it's because um, that's, they, were, they were successful in getting that distilled uh, emotion emotion. Yeah. to come through in the painting and that's why it still speaks to us and uh you can tell a painting that someone cared about and one that they didn't a hundred miles away and it's <laughs> not only looking at it i'm sure and feeling the emotion but maybe even from a technical aspect yeah. from somebody like yourself who can go okay he was just trying to get this one done yeah 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 i was just looking at some of the Maynard dixons out there <clears throat> in the gallery uh and it's been a while. I went to the Brigham Young mm-hmm. uh, exhibit numbers of years ago, and Abe Hayes had his collection mm-hmm. up in Billings yeah. at the Old Start Museum. But it just struck me again now how, and I was going to ask you this, I love those teens and 20s, mm-hmm. those juicy ones, mm-hmm. uh, more than the, I like the, I like the design and the composition of the later ones, but the flatter paint doesn't depend attract me as yeah, much his color his color sense in the way he painted is different and a lot of that has to do with especially the teens so he goes to the you know in 1915 they have the pan pacific is in san francisco and in san diego and what is he seeing he's seeing impressionists he's seeing futurists he's seeing all this art modern art different things that he he's been exposed but it's really in his backyard and he's competing at that show too he won some medals Uh but he keeps going back to that impressionist booth so those from about 1915 to and 1916 he really incorporates a lot more color heavy impasto and they change i mean they're different and then by the time he gets to the 20s that's changed a little bit he's not so not so much color not so much paint but it's still pretty thick so there's that time frame from 1915 to probably about 25 that they have a certain look to him and you know he evolves just like you evolved and are continuing to evolve as a painter and what you do he did too and so that flatter uh he started editing more as he as time went on yep i think he found the palette he liked and was comfortable with and was good at and quick and he wanted to edit he was trying to distill himself to the very basic 
nature of what the landscape he was interested in or the people that he was painting. So, it's a, yeah, you can tell a painting by how he painted the color, yeah. what age it'll be, what time frame. Yeah, and he, that puts him in a, like Carl Rungus, I, I believe, too. Um, but Maynard Dixon even more. How I admire them for um, always evolving and trying to find new ways to express their love for nature and mm -hmm. what they're seeing and, and what they want in their art and stuff. Uh, not, you know, just finding one pony and riding right. it the whole time. And are you doing that too in nature? Are you changing the way you paint? or? No, you know? I, I think so. Uh, if you look at this uh, painting of the Spaniards yes. or the Spanish Trail, um, something I've been working with here lately is this hot orange i love uh, that, that color I, by the way huh? <laughs> yeah and and you see it in your smaller painting too the one of the yeah. of the windmill that has right. that as well in the larger painting i i've started uh drawing this borderline around shapes with this hot orange and there's something in my mind's eye that just kind of makes uh luminosity just kind of fire almost a wayne tebow-esque kind of sensibility yeah, where yeah. he outlines and pops yeah so you're looking to continue to change so when some art historian comes back you know 100 years and looks at charlie fritch's stuff he's going to go oh there's a yeah hope, there's, hope a, there's yeah. i see that yeah. yeah well now let's talk about this lewis and clark project because <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty amazing thing um i don't really i don't know of any artist who's done what you did um and took the time, cared, and the commitment to paint this. So tell us, just go from start to finish. I'll just sit here and oh, listen because cool. I know there's a lot there, but <laughs> it's it's pretty fascinating. Yes, uh, there was a man uh, named Wayne York. We still talk once a month. Uh, he was raised in Sydney, Montana, which is just on the North Dakota-Montana border, right at the confluence where the Yellowstone River meets the Missouri River. <clears throat> And then it immediately flows into North Dakota right there in Fort Buford, one of the old cavalry posts is right there, military post. So uh, Wayne grew up with an interest in Lewis and Clark, and he had purchased some bronzes from Bob Scriver. And Wayne had the idea that he would like to have a painting done of the journal entry from Captain Lewis, April 25th, 1805, when Captain Lewis has come on uh, the, the big Yellowstone Valley expanse out in front of him. So you, you, if you know your Lewis and Clark history, they, they uh, left in May of 1804, and they went up the Missouri. They get as far as the Mandan villages in North Dakota, where they winter over. And then it's that next spring in, in 05, 1805, that they've continued west. They've gone through western North Dakota. They've now hit the Montana border. And, uh, of course, there's no Montana border at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so he writes this long, glowing journal entry of this Yellowstone Valley where Wayne grew up. And he wanted a painting of it. So he... Wayne is a, a, a lead chemical engineer with Exxon Mobil down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And he contacts Bob Scriver and says, you know, I'd like a painting. Does, would Bob know who could do that? Mm -hmm. And Bob refers him to me. And uh, so Wayne is 100% when he gets on a project. I mean, he's, he does these massive pilot plant projects and mm -hmm. stuff for Exxon. Mm -hmm. He's detailed, detailed, detailed. And uh, so... He flies up to Billings to meet with me, and mm -hmm. uh, we talk in the studio. He's already compiled a whole bunch of information and things. And you know, I had this vague, floating thing about Lewis and Clark. I had I hadn't studied it enough to know it in detail, not knowing they'd gone right up Iowa and all that sort of thing on the Missouri. And so we launch into this project, and Wayne is so much fun to work with because he's just so intense on it and detailed mm -hmm. and we're going to get this right and it was a lot of fun so we end up with this uh, uh large painting i think it was 34 by 64 or something mm -hmm. in that order <clears throat> of captain lewis overlooking the river and it was while i was doing that painting that i became aware of the fact that this bicentennial is coming because mm -hmm. i got commissioned in 1998 
and there's a bicentennial coming in 04, 2004. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in my naivety, mm -hmm. I thought, uh, well, I should do some paintings of the Lewis and Clark expedition and remind people that, that there's a, that this is Who the bicentennial. They are and what they are. And yeah. This is a really important <laughs> part in American history. Yeah. But my naivety was that I had, that it was my grand idea. I mean, the whole world was cranking up yeah, for this it. monster uh -huh. <laughs> celebration. Right. And little Fritz out in Billings thinks he's yeah. going to remind everybody. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, so then I started researching it, find out they didn't have an artist with them. And this bicentennial is coming. And I had done some, a uh, little bit of rendezvousing with the mountain men stuff. And so I knew about first person reenacting and all my traveling to do field studies just lent itself to what it would have been like. I felt I could put myself in the first person mm -hmm. of this artist with the core. I, I knew what it felt like to come around to Ben and see something glorious he wanted to paint. Uh, I knew the first person feeling of it all. And so that's what I set out to do. Well, at that point, I had gotten into a lot of the I'd worked hard to get into a lot of the shows like the Denver Rotary Show mm -hmm. and Prita West and the show at the Albuquerque Museum, Jackson Hole. I was in all these shows that I'd worked hard to get into. But if I was going to do this project, I had to pull pull back and mm -hmm. I needed all my time for the project. So uh, it also was a bit of a stimulation for me because it's, I had seen some of my older artist friends who had done these shows for years and you know they're getting a little complacent and i could even see that in myself i'd mm -hmm. been in some of them long enough and i thought i kind of want to spice my life up mm -hmm. and take it take it there and so that's what i did i pulled back and just what do i myself. think because that means less money coming in too when you're not doing these yeah shows. well uh uh wells fargo bank at the time uh -huh. uh, the lady who was in charge of uh, of the banks up in Montana, of the, all the banks, was a friend and a, a supporter. And uh, so we made arrangements, you know, to, to just have a business line of credit that I would just paint these paintings against that line of credit. Mm -hmm. And then Wells Fargo got a lot of uh, advertising uh, in those days when the exhibit traveled and things. So... Uh, we didn't really have to adjust. I just made it so that we didn't adjust our so living you, conditions. But, but you did take a, a big risk because if you didn't get to sell the paintings, right, then you got this money you spent. And yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. You're I was on the hook for it. I, I was well into the bank's. Yeah, I'm box, sure. Pocketbook there. And this is a project that goes for six years. Ten total. Ten total. Okay, here we go. So uh, <laughs> it, it it the I get the bulk of the paintings done um well before I, you I get, end up working before with, you get to the bulk of the painting because that's did so tell people how you went and you actually went to all these places right right well i yeah i traveled the whole route from st louis to the pacific and back twice and how many miles is that oh well it was four thousand or so by river miles and did you go by river on some of these on some of it i did most of it of course i was in my truck hitting all those spots and uh, in the end, it was a hundred paintings, but that was a little bit later in the story. Um, okay. when it opened in 2003, I had 62 paintings mm -hmm. done <clears throat> and I was working with the university of Montana. They were looking, uh, they had a huge website and a huge, uh, commitment to the Lewis and Clark story. I see. Stephen Ambrose was a graduate of there and great there were writer. some other really great historians, Harry Fritz, not a relative. Um, so the, the university was looking for something to hang their hat on and, and to carry the banner into this bicentennial period. And so when they found out what I was doing, um, we ended up collaborating and working together and they handled the administration of finding museums for it to go to and the transportation, everything. And, and I this was is busy. 60 plus paintings? Yeah. 62 paintings yeah. at the time. And some of these are very large paintings. <clears throat> In the end, it's uh, 13 or 14 crates, you know, almost the size of grand pianos that mm. move around and climate-controlled truck mm. and everything. Uh, so 
for the bicentennial, it opened at the university in 2003, and then it went to uh, the Oregon Historical Society, the Booth Museum, McNider Museum, uh, six museums mm-hmm. through the and course of the bicentennial. Too, right? And we did a book with the university, yeah. Yeah, that's no un- small undertaking as well. Yeah, so that that was the first one. Well, then in 2004 or so, uh, Tim Peterson, uh, a collector of Mountain Men and Lewis and Clark. And everything became, great, not just <laughs> that. Too. Lots of great things. Yeah. Became aware of what I was doing. And he called up and, you know, was asking me about it and said he'd be interested in buying some of the paintings. Mm-hmm. And I told him, yeah, I'm sure we'll be selling them, you know. And things. Right. <laughs> no, I won't and, as well uh, as Fargo wants my... <laughs> but as I kept developing up. this uh, body of work, it, the description we used was, you know, are you, if you sell it all off to 60 different buyers, it's like taking a pearl necklace and selling one pearl to each Yeah, no, person. it's true. It does, it does it, lose something for yeah, sure. Yeah, and so this grandiose idea of keeping it all together comes to us and i have a short list you know three or four people i think might be interested in that but i didn't know uh mr peterson well at the time it was just phone calls so he called up one day and he just to check in on how things were going and i said oh mr peterson i'm Hmm? sorry i uh i've kind of changed my mind i'm not I'm not going to sell them, you know, like we had talked in a gallery sale or something like that. I'm going to try and keep them all together and and sell them all as one body of work. Oh, well, I'd be interested in that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Who are you? (laughs) (laughs) So uh, that began our conversation, and and we've had just a wonderful partnership ever since 2005, and he ended up buying the paintings, and then he, it was... Uh, his idea to, I think at the time I had gotten up to 76 paintings or so. And it was his idea that it, it just sounded good. 100 paintings mm. illustrating the journals of Lewis and Clark. Mm. He also, it, through our discussions, we both knew that there were aspects of the expedition that hadn't been adequately addressed yet in mm-hmm. the paintings. So that gave us 24 more paintings to uh, address those uh, stories and th- that storyline and it was a lot of fun because uh he's so knowledgeable about the expedition that we could have this really intelligent fun talk about it and we could find all these little nuanced ways to incorporate some detail in a painting that addressed one of our concerns but that there was no way we had room to do a painting just about that mm-hmm. so uh what an example of that is uh York, Captain Clark's slave, who goes along on the trip. Uh, I can't think of the author's name right now, I'm sorry. Um, In Search of York is the name of the book. And that book was super enlightening to me. The author uh, gets you to understand what it was like to be born a slave, uh, your, your childhood friend, of this young William Clark, Mm -hmm. at some point you are educated and learn that while you're his playmate and his friend, he's the master and you're the slave. Mm -hmm. And he stays with Clark, you know, all through uh, growing up and everything and into adulthood. And now he's going along on the Lewis and Clark expedition Mm -hmm. because he goes everywhere Clark goes. So York has this very unique human experience to be a slave in the east and raised that way but now he's going out into the west where he has all the same responsibilities and duties as the enlisted men uh every privilege you know like carrying a gun and going hunting by himself and everything so that's the york that i wanted to do the painting of and i actually saved that painting for my 100th painting because i thought mm-hmm. i'm going to need a carrot at the end of the stick that, uh-huh. to get me through that last painting and so that's one of my favorite paintings in the collection how big was that painting do you know uh, it was maybe like 26 by 32 or yeah, so, so big vertical painting. but 
We also know York as Charlie Russell painted him with the Indians in the Mandan village trying to rub the paint off of him. Uh, the kids thought he was, the young Indian kids thought he was a black monster. He had all these special uh, attributes. Oh, he'd never, they'd, they'd, they'd probably never seen an African American. No, they hadn't in, seen him. No one. And you know how spiritual and mystic they are. I mean, yeah. they thought he had mystical powers, and who knew what capabilities this large right. black man had. So, uh, in the painting at Camp Fortunate in southwestern Montana, where they're switching their canoes for horses with the Shoshone Indians, over on the far right-hand side, I show the Indians trying to rub the uh, black off of him and handle him and things. It's a, it's a secondary story in that painting, mm. not the primary issue, but, but that's just an example of how... Um, there's multiple stories to be told about that one person, and mm -hmm. so we, we addressed it in a few different paintings. Yeah, so you saw the importance that this is just, an, he's just as important to the story as Lewis and Clark. He has a very unique story, for sure, yeah. as part of it, as did all those men. Uh, the sergeants, you know, a lot of them were illiterate. Mm -hmm. The sergeants had to keep journals, and the captains kept journals. And then York, York's role, York's role, I think, was, uh, you know, pretty well uh, ignored for decades and decades. Oh, I'm sure. 150 years. And how long was the Lewis and Clark uh, exhibition? How long did they go? Was it four, four well, years? Well, they left in May of 04. Yes. And uh, they returned in September of 06. So yeah. So about two and a half years. Two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And they were... Exploring the West, what was there? Nothing was really known other they were, than from yeah. the Canadian fur trappers, I guess, had some sense. Um, yeah, may, I'm not even sure. But, well, um, Mackenzie uh, and Thompson mm -hmm. up in Canada had traversed the, the continent. But they were working for the Hudson Bay Company and right. the Northwest Trade Company, and their whole purpose was commerce. They were just looking for customers and for Indians to bring them furs. Uh, Lewis, the reason Lewis and Clark's expedition, even though it uh, was about 10 years later, was that they did such a thorough job of documenting the trip and the f mm -hmm. fauna and the animals mm -hmm. and the people and, and journaled it. To, it so, and that was a government deal. That was set up by the government yeah, to do that. Yeah. yeah, they wanted to know what, what their assets were, basically. What was out well, there? they were looking for the Northwest Passage. Yeah. They wanted a, a cheaper way to the Orient. Right. And uh, they thought, sure, it had to exist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and Lewis and Clark, of course, they were expected to kind of run out there, figure it out, and be back in a year. Right. And uh, they were given up for dead. lost and yeah. dead. And uh, some of those early uh, French trappers coming out of St. Louis had gone ahead and started going up the Missouri regardless of whether relatives? they came back. Yeah, well, uh, which would have <laughs> been 1921. That, that was kind of the second wave of yeah. fur traders. That's... Manuel Lisa was the uh, Spaniard who was the first guy to come up in 1806 and 7, and he built uh, uh, Fort Fort Raymond after his son, or Fort Manuel Lisa, which is 30 miles east of Billings, yeah. where the Bighorn River comes in. Yeah, I think Bill Sublet took his first trip looking for furs in 1799. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he was out there early plowing around. <laughs> so when you finish a project like that, 100 paintings, 10 years, what's it feel like? I mean, I mean there's got to be ups and downs in the whole shebang. Yeah, uh, you know, there there was the business side of the whole thing, man, you know, taking it to all these museums, yeah, that's a big insurance, deal. transportation, uh, producing the books and things. And I periodically would get asked, well, isn't there somebody you could call, you know, who could help you? And <laughs> I would think about my circle, my very broad circle of wonderful friends in the art world. The only one I could think of to call was Byron Price. Mm. He was, you know, at That's the time he, he was uh, the director of the Buffalo Bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he uh, helped me a lot uh, in some of those phone calls. But as far as an artist, anybody who'd tried something like this. I did not know of anybody. 
Yeah. And what does it feel like though now? Cause you're really focused on that subject matter. I mean, you're ingrained to it. It's really to the nth degree. And now you're done and you go, what do I paint now? I would assume what's next. Yeah. Uh, so was that a hard that, decision or was it a well uncomfortable? I mean, we had those few years in there. Uh, oh, I guess it would be about 06 to 09 probably where Tim and I collaborated on those last 24 paintings. And when that was all done, then we did another, a second book with all 100 paintings. Yeah, I, bet. I hadn't done much of the writing in that first book uh, because there just wasn't time. But uh, Tim asked me if I would do all the writing in the second mm -hmm. book from what I had learned sure. and from yeah. the experience. And, and so that book was uh, something I'm proud of. And the full collection of 100 paintings and the new book all uh, came to the light of day at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center mm -hmm. uh, in 2009. Mm -hmm. And it was a really well received exhibit. Uh, they did a great job of displaying it. And uh, it's been off and running ever since. Yeah, and it other. still goes to museum shows. I mean, it was at it, Scottsdale Museum of the West for yep. well, I went to Tucson Museum of Art. Yeah, and I got the Willow Rock it. Museum. Got to see it. Those two. Yeah. The so, and that will probably continue for maybe forever until it finds its final, maybe final home. Or do yeah. we know that yet? We don't know. Yeah. Right now, it's at Springfield, Missouri, at the new uh, Wonders of Wildlife and Natural History Museum that. Uh, Johnny Morris and Bass Pro Shops. They spent 12 years building this museum and aquarium, and mm -hmm. it's beautifully displayed there, uh, being seen by about one and a half million people a year. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. What does that feel like to walk in and see 10 years of your life on the walls like that? It's fun to visit them again. I'm really pleased that so many people uh, value it as highly as they do and see it that way and and I, it seems to instead of you know a lot of those things the interest can tail off and it kind of falls into disrepair but it seems like this just keeps getting more and more air under it and more and more people care about it and uh it's been that way from the beginning i just needed to paint the paintings and it just had legs of its own all along well you know in a hundred years from now when they have the next one, they're going to be exhibited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have you thought of that at all? Yeah, I have. And I'm, you know, I, when I think about a, a lifetime of work, uh, I think having a, a pinnacle body of work like that, that is going to be revisited regularly. Mm -hmm. um, it should really be good for all the other paintings that aren't necessarily from that collection, but everything else that I did, I think will uh, get a lot of air under it and, and have some legs just because that collection will come, come up oh, yeah. every now and then. And do you get people asking you to do Lewis and Clark pieces for them? Uh, some, uh, but I have not said yes. yes to any of that. Yeah. I, I mean, that to me, that would have been what I would have expected. I mean, it seems like it's a chapter. You've done it. You've done it better than you could have even maybe hoped yourself. And, you know, chapters sometimes have to end and you go to the next chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, people would ask me what I'm doing, you know, now. It, and uh, it's just fun to paint in a lot, painting from Alaska this week and a painting from Arizona mm -hmm. the next week and a painting from Utah the next mm -hmm. week. And, and you haven't thought, oh, I need to do another big. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of really good Lewis and Clark ideas, but I just haven't, yeah. I've been busy. Uh, I mean, I could see that, you know, going, oh, here's another one that the Bozeman Trail or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's themes or, or stories, uh, you know, Red Clouds War, the Indian War, mm -hmm. uh, the Bozeman Trail, the Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. And I have been doing paintings of those, but I haven't made any effort to string them together as a well, body you, of work. You know what can happen if you do. So. <laughs> yeah. uh <-huh. laughs> well, and the first one was so successful, and and that was just an alignment of the stars. I mean, Lewis and Clark didn't have an artist with them. The interest in Lewis and Clark in, nationwide uh, you know, it was huge. Mm, very you much had so. Ken Burns doing specials yeah, and all that stuff. And I just this week 
got a book in the mail, a two volume set by an author in Poland who, uh, he tells me it's the first book that's ever been done in, in Poland about Lewis and Clark. And he was over here mm. extensively researching it, then wrote two volume mm. set on it. And he's, so, uh, I have two new books with my paintings illustrating it. I can't read a word of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So what's next for Charlie Fritz? What? Well, I'm enjoying uh, getting back to my relationships of the museums and the galleries and uh, painting what I am inspired to paint at mm -hmm. any given moment, not, not uh, tied into some parameters at all. Yeah. Um, I'm exploring with some new uh, ways of expressing nature, like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. With the orange outline. Yeah, yeah. And um, maybe pushing color a little bit more. I've always been very literal and mm -hmm. starting to uh, put a little more. I'm, I always used to really value uh, representing nature accurately. And uh, I'm maybe it's finally getting to the point of being a little bit more of an artist about it and saying I I can put in what I want to a little bit more. You're getting where Mayor Dixon was. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of a late to the party on that one, I know, but uh, I still uh, love standing out in front of a, a inspiring hill or coulee or shadow shape. And when I drive around and see something, a shadow shape that's cast on a, rim rock or something it's like stop the car mm -hmm. gotta paint mm -hmm. that <laughs> can't wait yeah. to mix that blue <laughs> yeah you're an artist artist yeah <laughs> you found the right path yeah yeah charlie it's been fantastic having you you're uh, just a wonderful artist and i've always loved your work and can't wait to see what this next quarter century produces for me yeah thank uh, you i know one thing it'll be original and it'll be good Wonderful. So, That's awfully nice of you to yeah, say, and I've true. appreciated our friendship yeah. over these years. Charlie Thanks for Fritz. all the support you've always shown. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Fritz, and you're in my new Maynard Dixon book. So, you know, Maynard Dixon's America West. You're one of the people that followed in Dixon's footsteps, and your paintings are in there, and they'll always be associated with him as well. I appreciate that. Yeah. and I, Deservedly on your part, for sure. Thank you. Yep. Charlie Fritz, Art Dealer Diaries. Thank you.